Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perpetual Chess. I am here with Ukrainian coming in from Germany, international master and chess trainer, Andrei Ostrovsky. Andrei, thanks a lot for joining us. Many thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited, Andre. So I, I'd seen you on Twitter and I was aware of your videos, but uh, having you as a guest, um, it gave me the opportunity to dig into them and they're, they're awesome. So I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if it weren't true. I really, I really enjoyed like, especially your calculation videos. They helped me out a lot. So thanks for all the good work you're doing for chess24 and chess.com and on YouTube, et cetera. Well, I'm really happy if this helps you uh, even slightly. <laughs> all uh, right. I need all the help I can get, so uh, much appreciated. So, Andre, we have to start. Uh, I want to dig into your background and how to improve in chess and all that stuff, but the zeitgeist in chess, of course, is that this, as we record on Friday, uh, the news about the Alpha Zero computer came out a couple days ago. So I wanted to get your perspective about what you think of this, uh, this revolution in uh, chess computing. Well, I guess that uh, nothing really happened. I mean, nothing dangerous for uh, all of us chess players and so forth, because, well, uh, one engine, probably a brand new one and uh, probably a different one, uh, outplayed another one and so forth. But we all know that uh, actually the chess engine is much better than a human being. Uh, it's not a new thing. So I guess the stockfish is uh, much uh, uh, better than Magnus Carlsen and so forth. So nothing really happened to human beings. I mean, so uh, we are still playing chess uh, against each other. So we are not forced to play against uh, machines and to prove anything. So we can still enjoy our game and we can still enjoy the uh, applied power of chess. That's what I mean. So uh, I don't think it is a great revolution. So maybe it is something new in the sense of uh, the artificial intelligence uh, development in general, but uh, it's not about chess, I guess. Yeah, so that's my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. It's uh, it's more of a human interest, and like you say, an artificial intelligence story. I mean, I've, as uh, like my client and people like that have written, uh, Chessbase had a nice write up about um, this uh, this news too. Uh, I think it was by Albert Silver. Um, it's a huge development for the world, potentially, or at least it could have huge implications. But for chess, I mean, who knows? But I am interested, like, in how it, like, did you dig into any of that stuff about the openings and how Alpha Zero, like, zeroed in on different openings and stuff like that? Mm, I don't think that uh, this will seriously affect, again, uh, what we uh, human beings usually do, because we simply uh, think differently. So, uh, we actually base our uh, decisions on different things. Uh, so I'm not sure if uh, it is really an appropriate thing to uh, say about uh, decisions if we talk about artificial intelligence, because I don't know precisely how does this uh, thing work and uh, so forth, because uh, after all, it is just an algorithm and so forth. So we have emotions and uh, I don't think that people will follow the, the way uh, best engines play because it's simply uh, impossible, in my opinion, to memorize all this tricky and uh, not very good looking lines uh, because they are based on probably some very deep calculations and so forth that the human being simply can't do all this stuff. So people will uh, keep playing uh, just normal openings, I guess. Uh, by the way, uh, there was an interesting interview in Noon Chess, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, Maxim Vashiela Graf uh, or Fabiana Carano, so uh, one of these two guys actually. And there was an interesting thing that uh, he said that, uh, well, top players no longer try to play, for example, uh, first lines in the openings. Uh, I mean, those lines that uh, engines recommend. Uh, what they try to do instead, uh, they're trying to find, for example, the third or 
forest line, uh, which is recommended by the engine, and to try to actually analyze that deeper, because they say, uh, well, everybody has an engine uh, installed on the computer, and uh, almost everybody can play like an engine in the opening. So the idea is just to avoid uh, exactly these recommendations and so forth. So uh, actually to keep it uh, just a human play, just a human game. That's what I mean. That, yeah, that's really interesting. And that's something that Magnus, I think it was, uh, it was, it might have been out of personal preference rather than like a tactical decision on his part. But I feel like he was sort of at the vanguard of that because he's been trying to just get playable positions, uh, yeah. even even before it sort of caught on with all the other elite players. But yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting because I mean, for a fish like me, it doesn't make a much of a difference. Like, who cares if you know the English is uh you know turns out that the English or the Queen's Gambit is you know point two better than what I play because I play moves that are you know minus two worse through the course of the game. But it'll be interesting to see how the top players try to reverse engineer what they can from uh, what uh, Alpha Zero um, discerns in the opening. And obviously, this is only the beginning. I mean, they only released a small amount of games, and hopefully we'll get even more information over time. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll uh, we'll stay tuned to this uh to this story and i'm sure this won't be the last time it comes up on perpetual chess but now i want to get on to actual your chess career so you're coming in from germany you're originally from donetsk ukraine so my first question andre is how, how'd you end up in germany all right so uh, at some point uh, i just decided to uh, go away from ukraine because we all know that uh, uh, many uh, bad things actually happened uh, during this uh, last years uh, so the worst thing is, of course, just the war, yeah? Right. And, uh, well, we used to have uh, a good family business there, so I don't want to say that we prospered or something like that. But, well, we earned, uh, I would even say, made decent money, so we were feeling fine, but then this great crisis and so forth, and we actually lost our business. So uh, it was probably the turning point. Uh, to be honest, uh, I was never uh, actually satisfied with the conditions. Uh, I mean, uh, I lived in Ukraine uh, because uh, there was just another world uh, not very uh, good for, uh, I, I don't know, my mindset and so forth. So I usually uh, was a person with uh, probably Western values uh, somehow inculcated in me by my parents and uh, so forth. So I was just not very comfortable with uh, uh, what happens in Ukraine, for example, on daily basis. All right. So uh, I always had this idea to actually go somewhere to a Western country. And uh, I was actually waiting for this great incentive to come. And uh, when we lost our business and uh, actually nothing really uh, stopped us from uh, making this great step and making this uh, great uh, decision to go away. Uh, we actually did this. So the question, why exactly Germany? Because I guess it is a great uh, uh, country in the sense of uh, playing chess uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, there are a lot of tournaments within Germany. And geographically, uh, I'm just uh, placed the way that uh, I can actually go to uh, almost any European country again to play in a tournament. So uh, it uh, helps me, to, for example, saving money uh, on these trips and so on. All right. And uh, there are also uh, another things, for example, companies like Chess24 and Chessbase are also uh, situated exactly here in Germany. So this gives some additional opportunities and possibilities to actually earn money and so forth. That is probably the main uh, set of reasons and incentives of uh, going to Germany. OK, lots of good reasons. But I've got a lot to unpack from that answer because uh, I just want to want to get out a few more details. So what was uh, what was the family business, if you don't mind saying. Uh, of course. So uh, we were actually uh, selling uh, children's wear uh, online, mainly okay. online. So it was like normal online business in Ukraine. And uh, uh, the uh, problem is that uh, our main brands were from Europe. So we were very dependent on the uh, exchange rate. And uh, once uh, actually Ukraine uh, jumped in this uh, great crisis, the exchange uh, rates uh, uh, simply uh, tripled. And uh, the, uh, as a result, the purchasing power of uh, our clients uh, dropped. 
uh, well, our business went down and, uh, well, it was no longer possible to benefit from it. That's unfortunate. So any chance of resurrecting the business now that you're like with, under the euro umbrella? Oh, uh, not really. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just, just move on. I mean, you're an amazing chess player and a very gifted uh, communicator. So uh, we're, we're probably better off, even though I'm sure it was uh, painful in the short run. And uh, you alluded to, like, uh, you said that we decided to move. And uh, I, I got a little background information about you from your student, Mike Zelazny. So I know that, okay. that you have a young kid. Um, so is that who you moved with, your, uh, your wife and child? Uh, not really. We moved with my wife, uh, and actually my parents also moved here. Uh, and so uh, my kid was born uh, already here in Germany. Okay. And what's the name of your town in Germany? Uh, Bielefeld. <laughs> Bielefeld. Yeah, I didn't dare try to say it without you, uh, <laughs> without you <laughs> telling me. Um, so how did you decide on that town? Uh, well, it's a personal thing, but uh, I think it's not a problem if I will tell you. So, uh, actually, uh, moving to Germany is not very simple stuff, right? You need uh, actually a German background uh, to move here, or maybe you should be the Islam uh, seeker or somebody, or there is another way you should be uh, just the guy with a Jewish background. And uh, my case is exactly the third one, mm-hmm. yeah? And uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I still don't know, uh, we had the connection uh, only to the Jewish uh, community in Bielefeld. That's why, actually, uh, we ended up here. So uh, there was a uh, long process. So actually, it took uh, almost two years to get there after application. And uh, actually, this community really helped. Great. And how are you enjoying life there? Uh, well, it's not that kind of city I really appreciate uh, because, uh, well, it's not that small, I would say. So uh, if we compare it to other German cities, uh, it can be considered even quite big. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, uh, there is a big uh, asymmetry uh, between uh, the, I don't know, uh, the um, infrastructure uh, which is offered and uh, actually the territory. So I don't know how to describe this. I have a bad feeling that uh, I'm actually not in the city, but in the village, okay. but it is still a city, okay. something like that. So even the uh, some villages nearby actually excite me much more than this actual city. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I guess, you, you know, you, you at least it's a springboard. You know, you, you made it to Germany, which is a great country with amazing cities. So uh, from there, you can uh, look around and plan, plan your next move. Yeah, um, most likely. <laughs> okay, um, and you, you're very busy online with ch- with uh, chess training. I mean, you're you're streaming. You do uh, you do training Tuesdays for Chess Twenty Four. Uh, you've done some calculation series, and now you've been busy on Chess dot com too. So, how did you um, how did you latch on with them, and and how are you enjoying the work? Well, actually, uh, right now it is quite hard to uh, allocate the time because uh, we should never forget uh, I have a family, right? So I have to devote uh, a lot of time to my wife and my kid and so forth. So uh, sometimes it feels really overwhelming. uh, But, well, uh, I just try to uh, keep thinking uh, in a very positive way because, after all, um, I'm doing... I hope I'm doing a useful thing uh, so many people can benefit from it. Uh, So the idea to um, actually work with chess.com as well uh, gives me a chance to actually reach out to a broader audience, uh, mainly American audience, for instance, and so forth. So uh, this is probably the basic idea. So I'm doing the thing uh, that is useful for somebody, not only for me, and so forth and this helps me really uh to keep up on this work but it's really hard yeah uh, i mean it's really amazing so sometimes i find myself uh, just extremely tired and uh, uh sometimes i have a feeling that well actually no one uh wants to hear from me and maybe i'm (laughs) doing the wrong thing and so forth Uh, but i think it's just normal for anybody who's doing the similar things yeah, I can I can definitely relate to that. Uh, I don't do I don't do much online stuff other than this podcast. But I mean, it's like 
sometimes you feel like your work really resonates with people and other times you feel like you're kind of like, you know, uh, pissing in the wind as it were. <laughs> so, um, yeah. uh, but I mean, I, I, I mean, as I said, I, for those for the listeners who haven't seen your stuff online, I really recommend checking it out. I think uh, you, you're a very good communicator, and I, I definitely think there's there's a place for you in the chess world. But but I get it because you know you're basically building a business from scratch. So how how long ago did you um when did you make the move to Germany? Uh, two years ago. Okay, yeah, and you know the the old saw is it takes five years to get a business really up and and clicking, which obviously. When you have a nine-month-old and a wife at home, like five <laughs> years feels like a very long time. Um, so, and I know that you've got a master's in finance. Uh, where did you end up? How did that happen? Well, that was very simple. Uh, at some point, uh, when I was uh, probably fourteen or fifteen years old, uh, there was a great choice. I mean, uh, there was a choice uh, between uh, pursuing the uh, professional chess player career or uh, actually uh, getting this higher education and so forth. So it was uh, initiated by my father, who just a very wise man. And uh, he asked me, uh, do you really believe you want to be a professional chess player? Uh, because it's time to decide. Because if you don't want to pursue the chess player career, probably it's time to think about uh, the normal uh, higher education. And uh, if you choose the second option, it's time to think uh, in which area you can actually uh, um be good as a chess player so with this uh, set of uh, chess skills right and uh, there was also a bear game uh, between different things so I was really into for example programming and uh, maybe physics and so forth uh, but uh, from I don't know Ukrainian perspective uh, it was uh, uh, not very um, promising. Uh, that's why we ended up with uh, this uh, finance sphere. Uh, because, for example, if you're a trader, uh, I mean financial trader, something like Forex or maybe stock exchange or something like that, uh, probably you need some chess skills there. So that was well, be not very wise idea after all. Uh, but anyway, uh, after uh, actually learning for uh, one or two years in the university and uh, actually reading a lot of uh, stuff uh, on economics and finance, I actually loved the um, scope. I loved the um, topics I was learning and uh, I was quite uh, used to that. And nowadays, I would uh, call the economics and finance my secondary hobby if compared to chess. And that was, uh, of course, this uh, university in Donetsk. Mm, I'm not really satisfied with the level of uh, my education, I mean the quality of my education, but uh, I was trying always to compensate that uh, with my uh, individual work on the topics I was reading a lot, uh, including some, uh, uh, I don't know, some written in English and so forth. Okay. Um, so any within the finance and, you know, financial market world, any... Uh any particular area of interest? Mm, it's hard to say. Uh, probably still something connected with uh, trading and uh, investments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is within the financial world, and uh, as for the uh, economics, mm, it's really hard to say. But probably uh, something like the uh, um, decision making. Decision making probably uh, because this. Uh, topic also uh, relates to chess, right? Right. And we, we can find a lot of similarities in decision-making uh, uh, within 64 squares and decision-making in the real world. And so, uh, well, actually, we can compare the things and uh, come up with some probably mutual algorithms and so forth. So uh, decision-making in general, it's probably not uh, a pure economic uh, topic, but, uh, well, still quite interesting. So uh, nowadays, I guess, the psychology economics and a lot of other uh, disciplines are strongly connected so it's really hard to tell where the economics um, for example ends and psychology begins okay um yeah and there have been you know many uh many chess professionals have uh, ended up in finance or at least dabbled in finance um regular listeners of this podcast have heard heard us talk about it a fair amount so we'll, we'll get back to the chess um but 
so just one final question tying up the the economic subject do you do you think you would want to get back to that potentially would you look for a job in that field or are you pretty committed to uh to being a, a chess educator and player at this point well it really depends but um as for now i guess that uh it is actually the point uh, where i have to uh make my well, I don't want to say final decision, right? Uh, because nowadays it's stupid. Uh, well, actually, uh, the patterns are changing and uh, some people uh, aged something like between 50 and 60 can uh, change the direction completely and dramatically. So we have some examples of this sort. Uh, but I guess, uh, well, it's time to uh, actually define the main direction, the major direction of my life. And I guess uh, that... Um, it will be very pity if uh, I will give up on chess and uh, actually do something uh, more standard. So uh, I have a feeling that I will stay with chess for a long, long time. Good. good. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe if there is a great opportunity, I don't know, which will help me to improve my financial uh, situation and so forth, maybe I will consider uh, going back to that sphere. But, well, I guess it is highly unlikely. Yeah. Okay. That that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Never say never. Um, so, with a finance background, as you you know map out your path as a as a chess professional, um, having made your way in the Western world, like, do you have like a, a a business plan, or is it like I know it could be hard with a young kid at home. So, is it more just like you know take care of your responsibilities and move on to the next day, sort of thing? Mm, well, actually, it's very hard to say. Uh, I definitely don't have a plan. Maybe it will uh, sound weird because, well, the chess player with a financial background doesn't have a plan. Uh, but, uh, well, I don't have this, uh, you know, typical plan uh, written on a piece of paper. Uh, of course, I have some uh, understanding of uh, how to move on uh, in my head. And uh, I always have this, uh, you know, milestones and uh, maybe some strategies and techniques of reaching those milestones and so forth. Uh, but uh, you will never, ever find a piece of paper uh, in my house, uh, actually, uh, with some details of this plan. So it is something that uh, exists uh, exactly in my mind somewhere. Right. Sometimes it is deep inside, sometimes uh, uh, it is not, but, uh, well, uh, nothing uh, which relates to some typical advices from, I don't know, uh, quick success books. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. If I wrote a business plan on a piece of paper, I would lose the piece of paper. So it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do much yeah. good. <laughs> we'll be back with more in a minute, but first I wanted to let you guys know that this episode of Perpetual Chess is brought to you by chessuniversity.com. For those of you looking to improve your chess in the near future, and who doesn't want to get better at chess, Chess University is offering a special discount to Perpetual Chess listeners. Right now, if you head to ChessUniversity.com, you can get an additional 20% off any recorded course in their online store. That includes courses by former world champions Anatoly Karpov and Vichy Anand. Those guys know something about chess. It also includes courses by previous Perpetual Chess guests, I am Nazi Pekidzi and I am Kostya Kovutsky. The various courses range from beginner level all the way up to 2200 level, and they typically combine multiple hours of video lectures along with additional puzzles and exercises for solving. These courses are already discounted for the holiday season, but for a limited time only, you can get an additional 20% discount by using the promo code PERPETUAL at checkout. So you go to chessuniversity.com, and then when you check out, you type in PERPETUAL, P-E-R-P-E-T-U-A-L, and then you get a 20% discount. It's a great way to support the podcast while working on your path to chess mastery. Chess University is also known for their Prodigy program, a monthly all-inclusive coaching program that includes many live classes from world-renowned coaches, such as five-time world champion Vichy Anand, Carlson's trainer and second GM Peter Hein Nielsen, former perpetual chess guest GM Alex Yermolinsky and I am Lawrence Trent, plus FM Dalton Perrine and number one selling online coach Karav Joshi. So what are you waiting for? Visit chessuniversity.com and use the promo code PERPETUAL during checkout to save 20% on your first course. Okay, back to the show. Okay, so let's talk chess improvement. So you're about 2450 feet A. Uh, Mike Zalozny spoke very highly of your your abilities as a teacher and said that you're probably underrated at that. And I sort of got that impression too. Like I watched... um. 
I watched the YouTube video. It was from your Training Tuesday series on uh, Chess 24, the one where you showed a game that was a uh, Carol Khan uh, and mm-hmm. just like went through the game for 90 minutes. And it was um, it was really enjoyable to watch. And it was uh, pretty eye opening for me because, you know, you said, I mean, it was a mainline Carol Khan. And you, you said uh, you didn't know the line very well, but you sure you seem to know it well to me. Um, so I had a few questions from that video. One was like, so you said, you know, the guy surprised you in the opening choice. So you had prepared something um, uh, expecting a dragon and then you got a Karo. So you were kind of caught out, but you were also higher rated than your opponent. Um, and in, in looking back at the game later, you determined that there was a critical game between Anand and Bereave in 2009 that kind of defined the line. And I was curious, like, when you go back and review the game, how did you know that that was the critical game? Like, how did you know that's the one that that establishes, like, what my plan was in this position? All right. That is a very good question. Um, so mm, I define the critical game uh, as something that actually uh, either closes the line or uh, shows the best uh, possible plan. And... Uh, It can be very individual because for some people, for example, this can be a great plan for others. Well, they just don't feel like that and so forth. Uh, But uh, what can uh, actually help you distinguish the critical game is that uh, after that game, for instance, no one actually dared uh, to play that again. And uh, so that's because I've. I've uh, hinted at this, like when I talked to John Watson, I was saying, like, as a kind of, you know, chess, like whatever you want to call me. I mean, amateur for sure. Um, when I, I, I never know why a line is closed, like unless a super strong player tells me. So are you able to, you're just able to deduce that because there are no more games after that uh, at the top level? For instance, yeah. So uh, you can see that uh, in your database easily. So for example, uh, you may notice that, uh, well, these moves are uh, made frequently, right? So these lines uh, show up frequently until, for example, uh, 2009. And after that, they simply disappeared. So what happened? Then you search for, let's say, a top game uh, of uh, guys rated like 2700. So uh, you can see the uh, game that ended up uh, with, uh, I don't know, the win for one of the players. And after that, uh, well, for some reason, there are no more games uh, on this line, so probably it is closed. You can also check with the engine after that. So you just switch on the engine and you see that, for example, it gives the great advantage to one of the sides. Maybe that is also uh, the way to explain the things, uh, just to help you understand what happened and so forth. As for that game of, well, I mean, my game in Karakhan and uh, that game uh, played by Anand and so forth, um, why I say it probably it was critical because uh, I was struggling to find the way to implement the plan uh, over the board. And uh, this game actually shows the concrete way, the concrete maneuver how to do that. So in that game, I was trying to make G4 work and uh, I needed to go away with the knight somewhere. And I struggled to find the cr- good moment to do that. And actually, that game of Anand uh, showed the clear way uh, at which po- moment to do that, what to be afraid, what not to be afraid, and so forth. That was probably my idea. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that was that was fascinating for me to see. And and thanks for that explanation. It um, that I feel like I'm slowly getting to the bottom of like how this works, like behind the scenes with uh, with stronger players. So, what's your like? <laughs> opening approach generally i mean as someone whose primary job is a trainer but you're still playing in the german league and stuff like that like how much time are you able to spend on on uh staying sharp with openings and uh well it's a very painful topic honestly <laughs> <laughs> because uh well probably uh that was because um i was really amazed by uh, the works of uh, mark dvoretsky uh, many years ago and uh, i was really happy to participate in two training camps and communicating uh, to mark dvoretsky in uh, person right and uh he was a uh, great ambassador if we call if we can call him this way 
of uh, actually neglecting opening preparation. Right. And yeah, he was uh, into actually the skills, training skills, especially end game skills and so forth. And at some point I actually uh, chose exactly this direction. So I somehow understood that, uh, okay, whatever happens in the opening stage anyway, uh, I still have to play after that. And uh, there were so many great examples at that moment. I was rated uh, around uh, probably 21, 2200, something like that. Uh, when I outplayed my opponent in the opening stage, uh, and in a lot of time uh, finding great moves and so forth. Uh, but then at some point, I found myself struggling to uh, find the critical continuation in a time trouble and actually lost winning positions, a lot of winning positions. You can't even imagine how many lost, uh, how many uh, winning positions I lost. And uh, at that point, I realized that probably uh, I need to be much more competitive, much uh, more efficient uh, in the middle game stage and in the end game stage and work on my general understanding, general skills like calculation and so forth to improve. And when I started doing that, uh, actually the results followed. Uh, and uh, probably nowadays uh, on my current level of being international master trying to uh, actually earn the uh, grandmaster title, um, I have to change my mind again and to come back to more serious opening preparation because now I feel like uh, there is a big lack uh, of uh, just opening knowledge and uh, I'm struggling uh, to get uh, good positions when I'm not prepared well. And why I'm, I'm not prepared well, because I just don't spend, uh, spend enough time uh, to work on openings. That's a big, big problem. So I'm trying, of course, to uh, actually um, learn some new lines. I'm trying to investigate uh, to some changes in the lines I usually play and have a great experience in. Uh, but still, it is not enough. So I have to work more and to devote more time to that. But this will mean that uh, actually I have to give up on making some uh, live streams, let's say. And who knows what is better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's got to be especially hard with the live streams because like, I mean, if, if you're giving up doing a lesson, it's very concrete. Like you're you're taking money out of your pocket in order for the possible long term gain of getting better at chess and, you know, working towards a grandmaster title, but something like a live stream is a little more nebulous, you know, like obviously you're, you're, you're potentially reaching a broader audience, but there might not be the, you know, the immediate benefit depending on, uh, you know, if it's one where you're being compensated or not, like at the time. Yes, sure. So uh, it is all about the uh, wise time allocation, uh, which is usually very hard stuff because uh, you don't really know at each and every moment what could be uh, better, right? So it, sometimes it just feels like, okay, I have to forget about everything and just uh, sit and learn this uh, opening line because, well, uh, I lost several uh, games, for example, playing Blitz, and I definitely know that it is a problem right now. And uh, since a lot of people actually uh, watching me live and uh, it's no longer a problem to find my, uh, for example, Bleeds games and so forth, they can simply prepare. So that is, by the way, uh, the thing um, I was fighting against when I played that game. Because I didn't expect Karakhan, but almost everybody nowadays, especially the uh, users of Chess24, they know that I have serious problems in Karakhan with oh, White. that's funny. So... Yeah, so uh, almost uh, anybody uh, playing Karakhan, for instance, against me, um, uh, and uh, I know that this guy plays this for the first time in his life, or I can easily tell that he has a special preparation. So he definitely prepared this opening against me. That is 100%. And, well, uh, probably I have to go away from main lines and uh, searching uh, the way to simplify the things or something like that, which is very, very painful play which white right right so it's funny though uh, i feel like i mean this guy's rated he was rated like 20 50 fide although having a great tournament so perhaps a little underrated but to me it seems like someone with that much of a rating deficit against you like i feel like they'd be better off playing what they know than even if it's like home cooking or whatever like special preparation i mean there's no substitute for experience in an opening so i mean the guy the guy played the opening well, what was the guy's name? Patrick, do you remember? I don't I don't remember his last name, but but uh he played the opening well, but I still feel like it's a little risky to to play that against someone four hundred points higher rated for the first time. Um 
personally. Absolutely. Absolutely risky because uh, I could have chosen, for example, uh, absolutely different lines. So there are a lot of ways, for example, to uh, moody the warriors uh, right from the start. For, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know, to play Panova attack or maybe something like Knight C3, Knight F3 stuff uh, where there is almost no theory and so forth. Yeah, it was really a risky stuff. Uh, but also an interesting way to actually... Um, uh, eliminates uh, my opening experience or something like that. Because uh, you should never forget uh, when you're a low player and you play against, for example, International Master or Grandmaster, even if, uh, for example, this guy doesn't know uh, the main line, all right? Uh, anyway, there is a high probability that he knows a lot in the openings uh, and so forth. So he can play almost everything. Uh, and, uh, well, if you force him playing something that he definitely doesn't know or uh, doesn't know well, uh, maybe it increases your chances. Well, yeah, it's it's a risk. But uh, on the other hand, it may pay off. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, you know, it's probably good to, if you're playing someone 400 uh, points higher rated, it's good to, like, play a higher volatility strategy because, you know, if the if the, if the the path of least resistance is taken, then you're going to lose as the lower rated player. So might as well muddy the waters. Um, okay, so we have a question from a listener uh, related to chess improvement. So this is from Chris Wainscott. And just for background, Chris is rated about 1,800. So he asks, if someone has 10 hours per week to study on to study chess, what's the correct balance between analyzing one's own games and studying other topics such as end games, tactics, openings, etc.? Uh, one of my favorite questions, by the way, because uh, so many people ask me about this, about the correct balance and so forth. So uh, I would answer the following way, uh, which is probably something uh, unusual, uh, but to me it is quite usual. So uh, when you learn chess, when you study chess, uh, just try to choose something uh, specific and to de dedicate your old time to that. That's the point. So, for example, um, if you decided to learn endings, just learn endings exclusively. So don't actually uh, mix it with opening preparation, with middle game preparation or whatever. So you can uh, potentially dedicate some time to uh, everyday routine like, I don't know, uh, solving tactics or something. But uh, as for the major topic and the major uh, targets, it should be something uh, single, Is this uh, like in my opinion. Is this like within a day or within a month like, or until you've achieved a certain goal? Like for, for how long? Um, well, uh, it is easier to uh, make an example using, for example, uh, endings, right? So uh, you know that you are bad at uh, endgame stage. So you start uh, learning endings. It's very simple to do because uh, in the vast majority of cases, uh, you deal with the information that doesn't change. Uh, so you just pick up, uh, I don't know, the endgame manual, for example, the manual from uh, Mark Dvoretsky or maybe the one uh, which was written earlier by Panchenko, also a good choice. And you start learning. So uh, you read this book from the very beginning till the very end. That's it. Uh, why it works? So uh, is there no risk, for example, to uh, be much worse in middle game stage, let's say? So many people are actually afraid of that. When they start learning endings, they uh, think, OK, maybe I will be a great player in end game stage, but uh, everybody will beat me in the middle game because uh, I'm just a very bad player in the middle game stage, right? But uh, here is exactly uh, where the magic happens, I would say. So when you learn um, ending, Right when you learn uh, this thing exclusively, you actually learn much more than just concrete end game positions. Uh, you learn how pieces actually work with each other or against each other. So in fact, you learn uh, the pieces coordination. And what is cool, all the things, if uh, actually learned correctly, uh, can be um, applied to middle game stage as well. So you actually increase your general understanding, you improve uh, your level in general. So, of course, uh, if we take the percentage, I would say that uh, if you work uh, on endgame stage exclusively, you kind of improve, uh, for example, 70% uh, uh, in ending but 30% uh, goes to other stages of the game because some things are universal for uh, the game in general. That's okay. what I mean. Okay. 
And is the reverse true? Like studying middle games also helps your end games? Um, sure. Okay. So, sure. 100%. So uh, almost in each and every uh, concrete thing uh, about chess, you can also squeeze something uh, general, which can be applied to other stages. And uh, you never know when uh, it might be helpful. Uh, for example, you can recognize the pattern from the end game stage uh, somewhere uh, in the middle game. Uh, in one of your games, sometimes even in the opening. So the pieces will be placed the uh, very specific way. Uh, and so uh, suddenly you realize that you already saw this somewhere. And so uh, you can even find some uh, unusual tactics or something like that. So everything is interconnected. That's what uh, many players actually miss. Okay. Uh, but, but so, like, just to... to uh, summarize because i you know chris's question is like it's a common one i'm probably in a similar boat i don't even have 10 hours i if i you know when my when the when the clouds part and i have time to study chess it'll probably be more like five for me um so would you say like spend a month on and like maybe do 15 minutes a day of tactics trainer or something but other than that spend a month on just end games um knowing that that will help everything i still feel like it's hard to know, like, when is a top... I mean, obviously, because the thing about chess is the topic is never done. So, like, how do you, like, how do you decide which area to focus on and for how long? Uh, so, uh, this information can be uh, picked up from uh, your own experience and your games, right? So, uh, when you see the trend, like, uh, you are always bitten in opening stage. So you probably have to pay attention to the opening stage, not uh, necessarily, for instance, learning the opening theory, but maybe you just neglect some uh, simple principles in each and every game. It is a very common mistake that uh, people repeat uh, even on a higher uh, levels. For example, they forget to develop all the pieces, something simple as that. Right. Uh, so you just have to analyze your uh, recent games first. Uh, and maybe a lot of games uh, to understand your major mistakes, your major problems. And uh, then it will give you good information where to start because uh, probably uh, there will be some areas that are most painful and you definitely have to start with this area. Mm -hmm. So if it is an end game, okay, just learn end games. If it is a middle game, so lack of a strategy, uh, struggling to find a plan, just dedicate your time to uh, learning materials on this topic. If it is, for example, uh, blundering uh, some simple tactical things, probably you have to do more tactics. Probably you have to learn something on uh, tactics theory. Again, just to in increase the uh, quantity of patterns uh, you should recognize and so forth. So everything depends on uh, your over-the-board experience, I would say. Okay. Uh, you should uh, every time start with the most painful thing. <laughs> okay. And if you were, say it was middle game planning, like, do you have any recommendations? Because I feel like that's a little bit like end games. It's easy to come up with end game books to look at openings. Same thing. You know what to do. But m middle games can be kind of a gray area. Um, middle games specifically, yeah, it's very hard to uh, actually name the grade book on that because it is probably the most uh, complicated area. And, uh, well, there are several books, of course, but I'm not uh, sure that they are very impressive. But uh, basically, I would recommend almost everything that was written by John Nunn. Uh, let's say he has a great book, uh, which is called Understanding Chess Middle Games. And, uh, well, it uh, actually covers a lot of uh, very important strategic and uh, tactical topics, uh, specifically uh, dedicated to middle game positions. So I think it would be a great choice to okay. start with. Great. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, GM Luik Van Wiele on about uh, six weeks ago, and he was a big fan of John Nunn's books in particular as well. So. Um, I will update our list of our ever growing list of up of uh, recommended books. Um, so I wanted to transition Andre to talk about the Pro Chess League. It's coming soon. I'm getting excited, and I know that you're slated to be a member of uh, the Las Vegas Desert Desert Rats. So, um, uh, how did you um, latch on with them? Uh, this is very simple. We already discussed uh, Mike Zelozny, uh, my student, right? So he lives in Vegas. And uh, actually, uh, when this story began uh, one year ago, right, uh, they decided to uh, actually make a team. 
and they offered me to participate. But uh, at that time, they had some problems with the uh, finance and uh, it was not possible, of course, to uh, actually uh, find great players to play for the team and so forth. So they were trying to uh, do the best on the local level. Right, because they have some great players like Timur Gareev, uh, Kaidentrov also uh, decided to play for the team uh, a year ago. There are also some guys that were simply ready to actually support the team for free and so forth. Um, so they actually invited me to play several games. Uh, so I played two times um, and uh, well, it was uh, eight games. Uh, for the team. Uh, the only issue was actually the time, right? Because there's great time difference between the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, so basically, uh, I had to wake up uh, at 4 a.m. or even earlier, I don't remember, uh, to play. But there was one day uh, when we were playing against uh, London team. Uh, so we were playing at normal time. So I was very comfortable with playing. And uh, there was a great uh, day for me because I scored uh, three and a half out of four uh, of my games uh, during one of my games against their game of Session, so wow. 27 hundred guy and so forth so that was uh, really fun uh, I actually agreed to play uh, in one of these uh, strange days I mean uh, waking up at 3 a.m. or something like that I was uh, of course less uh, successful uh, so I scored only uh, two and a half, I guess, out of four, uh, losing one game or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Still, it was fun, right? And this year, uh, when uh, our team actually got uh, some better funding and so forth, they actually uh, told me, what about uh, playing for us on a regular basis, like each and every game? I said, come on, guys, it's uh, really hard. I mean, 3 a.m., something like that. Hmm. So I'm not sure I will be really efficient. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure it will be helpful. But they persuaded me. Uh, they, they told me that, okay, it's not a problem. Uh, wish you our team will be definitely better. And uh, you're welcome. The only thing you have to actually stream at least 30 hours on chess.com and Twitch uh, to become a local player so that uh, we can actually uh, make an agreement with other players from abroad to play for us. I said, okay, guys, I can do this for you. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, and that's why I'm doing this, yeah, doing this challenge now. Uh, I already did uh, something around 10 hours, so 20 hours are still to come. <laughs> wow, that is great dedication. So uh, they, I hope they appreciate the, the time and effort you're putting in. Um, one thing I, I have to interject is uh, I do feel like now that you have a baby at home, you're like playing at uh, 3 or 4 a.m., it's like your sweet spot, you know, <laughs> whereas before, <laughs> before it would seem insane. But now it's like, oh, I'll probably be up anyway. So, <laughs> you know, I'm a total zombie 24 hours a day anyway. So might as well play uh, in this, you know, most competitive online chess league in the world <laughs> while, while you're awake. Yeah, why not? Yeah, exactly. Not? <laughs> um, so... So the team this year, I think you guys, you have team more coming back. And I think, did you guys add a strong player? Do you know who's who else is playing this year? Mm, well, I'm not really informed. Okay, I think Mike <laughs> mentioned someone, but unfortunately it's slipping my mind. But you guys can go to the Pro Chess League website and check out the rosters. They're still, uh, they're still being uh, set up. I am super excited for the league. Um, and, one th and I think I caught a little bit of your streaming um, from chess.com uh, on the YouTube channel. Was that one of the times you were, just, uh, you were doing the tactics trainer and just walking through it? Yeah, that was an interesting thing. Uh, so I decided to uh, actually uh, mix my simple playing against others because usually when I do a live stream, I just play against viewers or I play uh, a tournament or I play something else. So uh, I usually just play. So uh, I decided to mix it with, uh, well, a weekly show dedicated to uh, solving tactics because I think it might be helpful for um, novices, strong beginners, and uh, maybe even more uh, experienced players uh, to watch me actually making uh, decisions uh, in life, right? So um, usually it is really um, hard to understand a person uh, when he's talking about, uh, for example, a game he played. So he says, for example, I saw that, I saw that, I calculated this line, I calculated that line. But you never know what he really calculated over the board, right? 
you never know. So it can be just a lie, right? Right. That's that's a problem. And uh, I just wanted to uh, actually fill this gap and to show what uh, actually my um, uh, real thinking process looks like. Mm, and uh, that is the basic idea behind solving tactics. So I'm just starting with analysis of the position. So I show uh, the guys, the viewers, uh, what is it to uh, analyze the position. So what things I actually uh, take seriously, which things I simply uh, neglect and so forth about the position. And then I start calculating the lines so uh, they can uh, watch me uh, actually calculating uh, different moves. They understand the order of lines I choose. Uh, they can also train their, uh, for example, visual. I don't move my pieces. And uh, finally, they can notice uh, sometimes that uh, I miss some lines, right? I just blunder something and so forth. So that is also very interesting thing. So to, to see how a human being does that, right? So what is wrong about that? Uh, what is uh, good about that? Uh, and so on. So maybe I have some drawbacks in my calculations and so on. So I guess um, uh, this is helpful in many ways. And uh, I'm going to keep, keep up on doing this. Yeah, I find it quite helpful. Um, I'm about like 2170 feet a, and this is the second mm-hmm. time I've uh, I've checked out like someone around your levels uh, tactics trainer. I also watched uh, some of John Bartholomew's at some point, and it it I think I may have mentioned this once before, but it it surprised me just how helpful it was because I don't know if other people have this issue, but for me, when I start working through tactics, I as soon as I see a position, I start looking at moves. And one thing I've noticed with you guys is you, you know, for maybe like 10, 15 seconds before you sort of take a broad scope of the position where you say, okay, is this like a, you know, is this a checkmating type puzzle or a winning material type puzzle? Like you guys, are, I think are much better. Or is it like, are you going to trap the queen? Like you guys are much better about like knowing like from the top down what the first thing you're looking for is and only then starting to calculate. Uh, look, it is very important thing, by the way. Uh, because uh, what is going on over the board, right? Uh, what is the difference between uh, solving tactics and, for example, making decisions over the board? Because over the board, you never know that you have to search for tactics, right? So uh, no one tells you that, come on, Andre, or come on, Ben, now you're going to find the tactical solution. So only you can tell if right. that is a sort of position, right? That is the main uh, difference and uh, the main co- uh, sort of complexity and so forth. Um, so... In a real game, uh, when you make a decision, when you think about the position, when you think about the move, you usually already have uh, this um, analysis and evaluation done. Uh, I mean, the major part is already done because uh, you're playing this position for a long time, for several moves, I don't know, for 15 moves or something. So a lot of things about these positions uh, are already here in your mind, so you don't have to analyze it again and so forth. But when you first see the position, It's uh, very important, of course, to start with the evaluation because you don't have this all uh, previous information. You you didn't play that game, right? Right. Uh, But the evaluation is always here. That's what I mean. And if I see the position for the first time, of course, the first step I do is actually uh, the analysis and evaluation because it gives you an information in which direction to calculate. Because you can be a great calculator, you can uh, have, I don't know, uh, amazing calculation skills, but uh, the idea is uh, to feel the direction in which to calculate, right? That is the first thing. And another thing, right, we solve tactics not to actually uh, get the uh, tactics trainer rating or something. Uh, We solve tactics to train uh, our uh, skills, right, to improve our skills. And the best way to do this is actually to model the uh, real game situation, right? Because uh, then you will have to uh, actually use all these skills and all this uh, thing uh, over the board, right? And if over the board you come up with the evaluation, the same you should do when you solve the tactics online or whatever. So that is the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's And it's one thing I struggle with is like, sort of knowing like how much to calculate during a game um 
I mean, like d- depending on the time control. But uh, another thing I noticed from looking at you going through the games is, like, in addition to calculating better than me, you were just calculating more. You know, like positions that don't necessarily seem sharp. You know, it doesn't seem like okay, there's an answer here, but I still might have a tendency to, you know, settle on a few candidate moves and look a couple moves deep and then pick which one looks the best. But uh, And when I had uh, your fellow Ukrainian native uh, Eugene Perlstein on, he talked about how he worked with a trainer who taught him what he called the bulldozer method, where you just calculate every move of every position. And I felt like in, in watching you calculate, you were closer to that than, uh, than I am, for example. <laughs> well, uh as for, for example, silent positions or calm positions, uh, yeah, many people think that it's not really uh, necessary to calculate a lot there. Uh, moreover, uh, there are some books written uh, many years ago on that. For example, this How to Become a Grandmaster, uh, written by Kotov, uh, which is considered one of the best books on, uh, I don't know, uh, strategy, middle games and uh, decision making and calculation and so forth. This opinion, by the way, I don't think it is a great book. Uh, so there was also some interesting articles about this. Uh, that's in just uh, you, you know this uh, pure strategic positions where uh, there is no room for uh, combinations and so forth. You don't have to calculate, so you just have to uh, base your decisions on uh, pure strate- strategic um, ideas and so forth. But it, it, it's completely incorrect, in my opinion. You still have to calculate because. Uh, usually you have uh, more than one uh, options, right? And uh, to tell which one is better, which one uh, better serves your goals and your plans, you have to calculate, right? Uh, that's that's the basic. Uh, the problem for, I don't know, uh, not that experienced players is that uh, uh, not only they... Uh, calculate uh, not that deep, uh, they actually do this quite slow. And, right, uh, that's me. That is yeah. that is a big part. This is a big part of a problem, and this is also the thing that you should work on. So not only calculate uh, deep, uh, but also uh, calculate quite fast. And uh, this is easily done uh, when you actually force yourself uh, doing this faster from time to time. But uh, probably online tactics trainer is not uh, the best choice for it. So My wh- favorite choice is actually to uh, buy a book of uh, tactical exercises. There are a lot of different ones. And do this uh, actually uh, putting the real pieces uh, on the real board and just uh, trying to model again the real game situation uh, to find the solution without moving the pieces uh, at the same time using, for example, the normal chess clock. Uh, So for instance, if your goal is uh, to um, come up with the better speed of calculation, then you just give yourself, for instance, five minutes. You actually start the clock, the normal clock, and you feel like you're playing the game, right? And, uh, well, you make a decision. So after five minutes, you have to make a decision. That's it. That's that's a good so, idea, yeah. Yeah, the main, the main point is uh, actually to model uh, the real game situation. That is uh, probably uh, the most important thing that um, modern players simply miss uh, because we have so great software and uh, many players simply don't have real set of pieces at home. That's a big, big mistake because after all, uh, you play with uh, real pieces, right, on the right. tournament. And there is a big problem with the transition from, uh, for example, your knowledge uh, acquired uh, watching at, uh, uh, I don't know, the board on your chess base or somewhere uh, on chess.com or chess24. So how to apply that knowledge, how to make this transition to real pieces? Because you look at those pieces and you don't understand what is going on. So they just look different. It's like a different game. So to eliminate this problem, I strongly recommend to use uh, the real set of pieces and the real board to have it at home and uh, to use it as uh, uh, often as possible. Excellent. Um, Andre, I've I've loved talking to you. I actually, I, w- I have more questions for you that I would love to ask you, but unfortunately, I, I'm up against the time limit. So, um, uh, I, I follow you on Twitter. You're a good follow on Twitter. If, uh, if people want to reach you, um, what, what, which way is best? And you have a nice website too, so I can link to that in the notes. 
Uh, I guess the best way is, of course, following me on Twitter, because uh, following me on Twitter, uh, you won't miss anything chess-related that I do. Okay. And, uh, of course, uh, probably my YouTube channel. Okay. So, YouTube channel is the source of most instructive stuff I do. Excellent. Well, Andre, I'd love to have you back on back sometime. Like, we didn't even get into your interests outside of chess, beyond finance, like what your day-to-day life is like. And, and this was so helpful in terms of, like, how people can improve their chess. So, I'd love to, to dig in more someday. Um, thanks thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me once again. I'm happy if this helps. Thanks to everyone who supports Perpetual Chess. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing the show, it can be hard to find the time. Donations from listeners make a huge difference and make Perpetual Chess a lot more sustainable. Special shout out to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. They are Adrian Gutierrez, Chris Wainscott, Coach Stage Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Ricky Grahava, Rob Zorchek, Tatia Abrahamian, Tim Seymour, Todd Bryant, and Zhao Chang. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks, everyone. 